their stories arced. Um, one thing that was really important to me when I was writing this is that, and part of, uh, you know, one of the things I guess that's a little unusual about, about this novel is it's all set in the present um, other than a brief prologue. And so usually I think with these uh, historical stories, they go back and forth between the past and present. But I was really interested in this idea of what can we discover about the past based on the items left behind. Um, mm -hmm. And so I kind of set that up as uh, a challenge for myself. But in order for that to work, I, all of the characters had to have their own stories independent of their journey together to figure out how their grandmother had this diamond. So, it, so I was very conscious throughout of trying to create a clear arc for each of those characters where they both, you know, evolve and devolve and stuff like that. Yeah, and you know, I think I love, first of all, the phrase clarity characteristics. I mean, I feel like that's a good way to just start brainstorming characters in general to have an imperfection or something that you think of as the core of this person and then you see the way it manifests in the world and within a family. Um, and, you know, as I was saying, I feel like these these imperfections with each character is is really what made me love them. And I was wondering who your favorite was to write. Um, which one, which character did you start with? Which one, and this is for, for my novel, for instance, like I have a different answer for which one I feel most similar to and kind of closest to and which one I loved the most. So I'd love to kind of hear both. Yeah, so they were they were all fun to write in their own ways. I think my favorite character was the mother, Deborah, which is funny because uh, readers who, some readers, that's their least favorite character, I think because she's so flawed. Um, and sometimes it, it's, it's been really interesting. And I don't know if, if you've had this at all with, with your work, um, but hearing people's response to uh, imperfect or flawed characters or unlikable characters. And uh, some people respond really negatively to, to unlikable characters. Um, yeah, I think it seems to me like everyone sort of has their tipping point. And I think that, you know, it, it, it kind of depends on the reader. But with Deborah, I, I can see how some readers might resist, you know, her mothering instinct or lack thereof. But I actually loved, I loved that aspect of her character and I loved how human it made her. And also the, this idea that she, she is changing over the course of this story, that this diamond is in some way kind of clarifying what they want to mean to each other. Um, but go ahead, I, I interrupted your answer about who. Oh, no. Yeah, I mean, I think what was, what was really uh, fun about writing her is that on the surface, um, she's like the, the least empathetic character. And some of the, I think her character in a lot of ways was a collection of stories I've heard from other people with some of their, some things that like their mothers have done to them. Um, my mom who's listening right now has never done anything to me like, <laughs> like Deborah did to her children. Uh, but, but so, you know, I, I didn't, I think it, it seemed to me, it seemed really easy to, to judge her and dislike her. And so I, I made it part of my, you know, mission to to see how she became the kind of mother that she was both in response to the way her mother was and also in the bad choices that she made and and she has a lot of regret so it was you know it was fun to sort of write and to try to uh redeem her throughout the course of of the book i think um i also really the other character i really like is i really like jake and he's he's another one that so i think because um i have a lot of female readers and they're like i would never want you know my daughter to to date someone like him because he's he's pretty immature and irresponsible but I found it to be in kind of a lovable way and one thing was interesting I talked to at USC a couple of my colleagues were teaching a summer class with high school students and he was they all loved him I guess they they couldn't tell I think that he was irresponsible um yeah I mean sort I of, you you bring us into his decisions in such a convincing way that I loved him and I could even understand why he is over the course of the novel making decisions that I would certainly not want, you know, my spouse to be making or the father of my child to be making or any of that, but I loved him nonetheless, you know, and I could kind of understand it at every point. And I think that's a testament to, to all, I mean, all of the characters you created here, I feel like have these very human flaws and, um, but I believe in them completely and love you know, Despite these these wrong choices they're making and the kind of like feminine them in. Yeah. Um, Oops, I froze for a second. Did you hear me? Where did I lose you? I think I could hear you the whole time. Um, okay, good. Yeah. 
I think you might be frozen again though. Um, so, oh. so another thing that's, uh oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Another, another thing that struck me in reading the imperfects was just this, this similarity to the bookshop of yesterday's in, um, in the fact that there's a, there's a surface mystery that's really gripping. You know, there's, there's this diamond. We want to understand how this family, the Millers, um, have come to possess it. And in the bookshop of yesterday's, uh, there's also a sort of mysterious inheritance. And underneath the surface of that is this desire, it seems to me, to sort of understand these people that we've loved and lost. And I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about like what's drawing you to that theme and whether that's something that you consciously set out to write or whether it's something that sort of bubbles up in the story as you're creating it. Um, I think, I think in the, uh, in the bookshop of yesterday's, it sort of happened organically where I knew I wanted to, um, I started with the idea of a scavenger hunt in a bookstore. And so from there, I kind of, you know, played the sort of like, well, what if like, or, or how would this happen? And, and I came about to a family estrangement. Um, and then from that, I, I realized that I was really interested in exploring families and the way in which the past affects the present. Um, and so uh, when after that book, and I think also as I've gotten older, and I think that this is probably the case with a lot of people, I just come to realize how many stories about my family's past I don't know, and how many I can never know, um, maybe because my parents don't know them, or because um, the people who they're about have passed away. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting because when, for this book, I also did a lot of research on Ancestry.com. Um, I, I won't spoil anything in the middle of the book, but I found uh, records that I used that were of like actual boats that came to the U.S., stuff like that, that I ended up using in the novel. And so, of course, while I was doing that, I kind of peeked into my family as well. Um, and, you know, one of the things I found really interesting is I found the, um, I think it was the, the census from the 30s, which is the most recent one we, we have access to. Uh, and my great grandmother, my dad's grandmother was on there. And it said on there that um, she was German and uh, she was from Hungary. And I, so I asked my, my parents about it and they said, no, that she was from Hungary. But according to the official record, she had, she had lied and said that she was, she was a German Jew, not a Hungarian Jew. And so if I only knew the record that was available, you know, through the census, I'd have a different narrative for her and for my family. And um, I thought that that was so interesting and just the way in which these official records can tell stories that maybe aren't exactly true. And so I guess through writing this, you know, I started with the idea of the diamond and then through writing it, I realized that I was really interested. I, you know, as I was saying before, I set up this goal, of how can I tell a story about the past in the present? But that made me really aware of the ways, of the stories that, are passed down the stories that we can piece together through objects and records that are left behind and then the inevitable things that are, are lost and can't be retrieved and so I think in this book you know the family is able to retrieve a lot and I, I did that intentionally because I wanted to create a story that sort of showed the promise of you know even if people pass away it's it's not too late to find out more about them yeah yeah um, so one, one last question sort of about the craft, and then I'd love to just talk a little bit about your, your writing habits, especially now that we're in, you know, various states of quarantine. But the, one of the things I admired so much about the book was the perspective and the, how fluidly you move between the, the perspective of each of the Millers. And um, I've, I've always wanted to write a novel with an omniscient perspective and was very sort of jealous of how um, just seamlessly you, you did it. Um, but something that also struck me was that it's really hard to keep secrets when you're writing with an omniscient narrator, right? Because the, the omniscient narrator requires that you move into whatever character is sort of feeling most urgent in the moment or else your reader might feel a little bit denied. Um, and so I wanted you to kind of talk about how you came to make that choice, whether it in any way sort of impacted what happened. And also just to say that I love it and that I think it's, it's, it's really amazing because I think it, it kept the book from having the characters keep secrets from one another and instead sort of joined them together towards discovering this one central secret. 
Um, yeah, but yeah, can you talk about that and whether you, you played around with other perspectives or did it just sort of emerge like this? Well, you know, it's funny. I, I think we, so um, when pre-COVID, I feel like you were mentioning our friend, or how we became friends. I feel like a lot of our friendship developed on walks and talking about writing and books. And I, I remember us when I was like really early in the process talking about different points to view. Um, you know, this, my... My first book was a first person point of view. And with that, I played around, I kept changing it. Like it was always just one, um, well, it, it dips into other people's through the stories they tell, but it was primarily told through one character. And I knew I wanted to do that. I just couldn't decide if I wanted to do uh, first person or close third. And I kept switching back and forth. And then ultimately I decided on first person. And after that, I was like, I don't think I ever want to write first person again. And so I liked the idea you know, I, when I was developing these characters and I did some, which is the first time I've ever done it, I did some exercises that one of my friends gave me to help you get to know your characters better, sort of a, a really extensive questionnaire. And I filled it out for all of the main characters, which led me to surprises I wasn't anticipating uh, in their characters. And I just really liked all of them. And so I wanted to know, I wanted the story to be shared between them. And I kind of wanted, you know, there were a lot of scenes where I wanted to know, uh, what each of each of them was thinking. And so I decided pretty early on that if I was gonna do a, a third person, I wanted to just kind of not create too much order in it and just sort of when they're all together, shift between who, who's ever, who perspective I wanted to be in. I think the book that really helped me with that, which is one of my favorite novels is Away by Amy Bloom. Okay, yeah, I read yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, I had read it a while ago. I've read it multiple times, but I hope I'm not at all mis misremembering it. But one of the things that, um, I, I think that's a beautiful novel, but one of the things that really impressed me about that is the way in which, you know, it was primarily one character story, but she would, whenever she felt like it, she would just go into another character's yeah. point of view. And that really worked for me. So I, what I did, I didn't think overthink it just when I was writing. Um, I, you know, I dipped into to people's narratives when I wanted to. I, when they were all together, I dipped into their perspectives when I wanted to. And then afterwards I went back through, which was very tedious. And I had a different color, uh, like a uh, post-it for each mm -hmm. character. And I just went through and put a post-it everywhere we were in their points of view. So I could see where it was too heavily weighted on one character and not another. So there'd be, I'd be like, oh, Deborah hasn't been in the book for 50 pages. Maybe I right. need to, to go back right. in. Um, but yeah, it was, it just, it just felt, um, which it's, it's interesting. And I don't know if this is, I think you're working on a new book, um, than the case for you with, with, with your writing, but it feels like some projects are a lot more challenging than others for whatever reason, every book has its own, uh, process. But for this one, it was a ton of work, but the shape of it pretty early on in early drafts was pretty uh, consistent with the shape in later drafts, which was 100% not the case with my first book. And was that true structurally also, which sort of just leads me into the plot. And did you know what was going to happen with the diamond? And I won't say any more than that. When you set out to write it, did you outline or did you just start sort of exploring what might happen if a family were to discover a diamond, $10 million diamond like this? Yeah, well, so I knew the lesson I learned, and I think it's important to pay attention to the lessons that your books are teaching you. Um, the le the first, so the bookshop of yesterday is I, I started before I knew what happened in the story. And so I spent years kind of revising and trying to figure out what the story was. So I knew that for the imperfects, I wanted to know what, not necessarily what the book was about, but what happened in the story before I sat down. So mm -hmm. I didn't, I, I played around with um, the first hundred pages, which actually uh, until, you know, uh, were, they were a lot longer. Um, so I've condensed that to about 50 pages, but they were pretty similar to, to what's there now. Um, but, but beyond sort of exploring the characters, I waited to write until I knew what happened to the diamond in the past. I knew I couldn't write the book until I knew what the mystery of the past was. And so that, so I didn't necessarily, I knew what I wanted to have happen in the end of the book. Although I ended the book about initially about like 40 pages earlier and um, where I won't tell what, but there's a big reveal. And my editor was like, 
you have to, you, you can't leave the reader at this, at this moment. Um, so I wrote, so I had known what happened. I just didn't put it on the page. So I wrote through, through that, but, uh, Otherwise, yeah, I mean, the, I didn't know, I knew I wanted to have a lawsuit, but I didn't know what that would look like. And it was, it took me a while to land, because I was reading a lot about the Nazi looted art cases. Um, and I didn't know that much other than that about uh, cultural heritage law. So it took me talking to a few experts to realize uh, what kind of lawsuit it would be. Um, and that it would be what's called a civil forfeiture, which was something I didn't know anything about really before I started. Um, so it sort of evolved organically, but I had kind of the beginning and the end in my mind, which and then sort of right. let, let the research guide the middle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, well, uh, before we open it up to questions from, from listeners, uh, I thought I would just ask you what you're working on now. And also what does working look like for you? I know you're a, a new parent and are, you know, juggling having a kid at home right now and writing and and yeah, I just love to hear what your, what your habits are in the hopes that maybe they'll rub off on me. <laughs> um, I've, you know, it's, I, the, I wrote The Imperfects in about two years, um, which I think for non-readers does not seem that fast, but I think, I mean, not non-readers, non-writers, but I think for write, writers know, really, it, it, that included like copy editing stuff. So I, you know, especially considering the amount of research I did, I wrote this book really, really quickly. And part of it was because about halfway through, I found out I was pregnant and I knew that it would be much more challenging to write a book with an infant or in a newborn than it would before. Um, so that gave me a really good deadline to motivate me to finish the book. Um, yeah. But it exhausted me, that pace. And I'm just in, I'm constantly in awe of these writers I meet who, you know, regardless of their, if they're writing genre or literary um, or something or commercial that can put out a book every year or even every two years. Cause it's so, so much work, even if you're not doing a lot of research. Um, so I, I've spent a lot of the past, I guess, like 10 months thinking and pl sort of plotting the book. And then I really didn't start uh, working on my new book at all in terms of researching until about um, March. And so now I'm starting to be in the thick of it, but it's interesting. I don't know if this is the case for you as a parent, but I've kind of realized that since I started working, and I'll mention in a second what my new book is about, but since I started actually you know, putting words on the page, I feel like I'm all the time both writing and not writing. So it's like, I'll sit down and um, part of it is that I haven't been home. So our uh, routine's a little disrupted, but I'll write like for 10 minutes and then my son wants to be crying, so I'll have to go do something. And yeah. then I'll come back an hour later and write for five more minutes, um, which is not my how I used to write at all. But there is something nice about yeah. it because it means I'm, that I'm constantly thinking about ideas. I don't know about you. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I have a very split brain right now and just not having space and time has proved, has proved pretty, pretty tough. But my husband's right we got a pretty good balance going on. I write in the morning, he writes in the afternoon, and then whichever one of us is not writing hypothetically watches the kids. Um, and that's kind of the balance we've figured out. Um, but, but, and for me, I actually think that's working better than it is for him. I can't really write for more than five hours a day, which is what, what it boils down to. Uh, so it's, it feels like plenty of time for me as long as I'm willing to let, like sort of let the rest of life go, which during COVID has actually proved a little bit easier um, than it did in non-COVID times because, you know, the kids don't have any nowhere to be, um, no, you know, so it's it, it being homebound in a sense is kind of, I don't know, stripped us down to the minimum. So we're getting our writing done and the kids are getting school done and that's kind of it. Yeah, I think for, especially if you don't have kids, I know a lot of writers have, well, and a lot of writers have not found this to be a very fertile period, but a lot of writers, I think, who are sort of more untethered have, have really seen this in a lot of ways, like kind of a writing retreat. Um, but yeah, which has not been the case for me, but I do think it's been really valuable. So, so my new novel, um, and then maybe you'll tell us a little bit, because I, I know that you've had a couple of ideas floating around. And I'm very curious which book <laughs> you've decided to work on. Um, my, my, new, my new novel is about, um, a, a vineyard in a family run matriarchal vineyard in uh, San Inez Valley. And it's, uh, it's, it's uh, started before prohibition and it kind of, it starts in the present 
uh, where this family is all convening on their family vineyard um, for a wedding. And uh, while they're there, they discover old bones buried um, underneath the vines. And so it goes back in time and kind of tells the story of this family and also the history of wine in the US, particularly in California, um, to sort of explain, you know, how each generation affects the one that follows um, back until you find out whose bones are buried there. So cool. it's, yeah, it's been I really fun. It. Be a good omen for marriage though. Huh? Oh no, I lost you. I said that that couldn't be a good omen for a marriage to find to find bones. <laughs> that's can, true. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah, it's that's true. Um, and I actually don't know what happens to the couple who gets married after the book is over. Um, but yeah, the only problems I've been like it's been re really fun. I've been talking at uh, winemakers. Uh, it's about to be harvest season, so pretty soon nobody's going to return my emails. But right now, sort of in the pre-harvest. People have been pretty accessible, so I've gotten yeah, to talk and to you. You probably have captive audience right now. Yes. Yeah, but the problem with learning about wine is you start. It's not that you understand why expensive wines are expensive. You understand why cheap wines are cheap. So uh -huh. now I just want to drink better wine. So I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> but um, well, can you tell us a little bit about which project? You've decided yeah, to work on? yeah. So I'm actually working on two, and I'm working. I'm working on a really commercial mystery that I'm really excited about. I sort of oh. at night. Um, it's a murder mystery. It's fun and fast. Um, and then during the day, I'm working on uh, another, you know, literary fiction project, and that's. Um, loosely based on my mom's story. My mom was one of the first uh, women to go to Princeton before Princeton became co-ed because she spoke Russian. And uh, they had a program called Critical, La the Critical Language Program. Um, and they had uh, 15 women come to the all male school um, and all of the women were, were specialists in Cold War languages. Um, and Princeton, of course, at that time was also a real um, sort of breeding ground for CIA agents. So. Uh, I have a couple storylines sort of um, coming out of that that era um, and one character, you know, very loosely based on my mom. And then uh, she does end up in Russia. So as she did in real life, she lived in Russia in the 70s. So uh, this, the novel follows her and, and uh, her husband there and then things sort of devolve. Um, but that's kind of kind of as far as I've gotten. But yeah, you know, I've, I've, I've had a good run of, of writing over the past few months. So I feel really lucky about that. Yeah. That's great. How well, she, are you? I've never worked on two books at once. How are you finding it's juggling fun. two projects? It's I haven't either. Um, I, I sort of struggle and chip away at the critical language uh, novel during the day. And then at night I have tequila and really quickly I'm writing this mystery novel. So Great. Only time will tell which approach is better. Um, but yeah, that's been my strategy so far. So shall we see if we have any any questions? I don't know if the chat the chat is open to everyone. I don't think we have any yet and if not I am always really curious Amy to hear what you're reading uh, because you give me great questions. Yeah um, well I uh, I can start if there's no questions I've been I've I definitely always I in the past like couple years I've started reading multiple books at the same time so reading, reading a bunch of books about like science of wine and stuff like that um, last night I just finished a really wonderful novel about wine called The Lost Vintage by Anne Ma. It came out two years ago and um, it's a historical fiction. It's, um, you know, it's, it is one of those books that has like a present day story and a, a past story, but they're both super interesting. And it's about um, the Nazis and wine and France. It's really good. I highly recommend it. Um, I just started reading and then, so usually read, so when I'm working on a book, I don't know how you are. I, I tend to go back and forth between should I read other books that are kind of somewhat about the same topic or should I avoid them entirely? Um, I decided with something as massive as wine that I wanted to see, cause I'm learning, I'm trying to learn as much as possible, 
but I don't, it's finding that balance, particularly with, with the science of how much do you put on the page and how much do do I still need to know? Um, it's been nice to like, to be reading some, some novels, uh, that, that grapple with that. Um, then I also like to read for fun, of course. So I just started reading Mexican Gothic, which is super fun. Um, what about you? What are you reading? I'm reading the overstory. Uh, and really loving it. It's not at all what I expected, and who knows how I came upon my expectations, but I'm loving it. And then I'm listening to Shiner, and um, I've also been listening to Ben Rhodes has this new podcast, so that's sort of been occupying a lot of my time recently. I've been doing a lot of driving between North Carolina and South Carolina, and it's called Missing America, and I'm I'm obsessed with it. It's really good. Uh, and also, there's one that's that's very up my alley, another podcast called The Winds of Change, which is um, about this song uh, by the Scorpions, um, a, like a bit, like a, they were actually a German band in the 80s, like a big German, like, like heavy metal, hard rock band. And uh, this song that they had was incredibly popular worldwide. Like, I think it was sold, it's like the 11th most um, sold single in the world. Uh, and this podcast is all about this idea that the CIA might've actually written the song because it's about the collapse of, um, the Berlin wall and might've, you know, written it to incite sort of, you know, uh, a, a cultural shift, um, in the Soviet union. So that's fascinating and I'm, I'm loving it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I've kind of been, been listening to a lot of, you know, sort of political news stuff recently. And then also Shiner and the overstory. Um, and it's a good you know, balance my tequila and nighttime novel. So that's kind of all I've got going on. So we got, uh, we have one question here from Jacqueline Thomas. Uh, oh, okay. So Jacqueline, you're asking about our experience with, uh, literary magazines and, um, how, how we, how we connected with our agents. Um, so I can, I can go first and then Amy, do you want to dive in? So sure, I actually, uh, found my agent through, um, through a literary magazine. I had had a short story published in a magazine called Glimmer Train, which I think sadly is no more. It was run by two sisters in Oregon. Really? Yeah. I think, oh, I think they, they've stopped printing it. Um, but I had my first story published there and was really excited about it. And my agent, uh, who at the time was, you know, kind of a freshly minted agent, she was really young and was reading a lot of um, really small literary magazines to find authors. She reached out to me based on that story. We started emailing. I had already written 50 pages of my novel at the time, although it would be unrecognizable um with the novel that's actually been published but but I sent her those 50 pages and and I was lucky to sign with her based on that so um that's that was sort of my path to to agenthood and as far as literary magazines in general go I sent stuff out to them sort of tirelessly until the novel was published and now my agent does does that for me which is a really fun perk of of finding a wonderful agent yeah um yeah i think i i've had a a few stories published um but i i did not send things out tirelessly to literary magazines um i think i got even though uh, rejection is i think a part of everyone every writer's process i think i started to get a little discouraged um by I would get like a lot of those like personalized rejections that were sort of, it was like close, but, but not good enough. And so um, eventually I just kind of lost less steam with that and really focused on the, on my first novel. And so I think Lydia, I think we sort of had a po- opposite mm-hmm. experiences. Um, I found my agent, I just, um, I was lucky. I have a good friend who works in publishing. And so he, he works in nonfiction, but he gave me a list of agents that he thought would be a good fit for my work. And it was only, it was like a list of 10 and about half of them he knew and half of them he didn't know. So the ones that he did know, he, he helped put me in touch with them. Um, my agent that I went with was not one of the agents that he knew. So I just submitted it to the slush pile. And I think one of the things that was, that I always tell during like uh, agent workshops, stuff like that um, to, to other writers is that I got the same amount of requests and responses 
from agents I had contacts with to, to the, um, with agents that I didn't. So I think one of the things that's really nice about publishing is that agents do read their slush pile. They do read the pitches that, um, and the query letters that come in unsolicited. And I think that's because if they didn't, publishing would be even more insular than it already is. Um, so that was how I found my agent. Um, and yeah, it's, I will say too, I worked in publishing before I went to grad school for creative writing. I was an editorial assistant and my job was to read the slush pile at the publishing house where I worked. I worked for a fiction editor and a nonfiction editor. And I think that helped me a lot. Uh, it helped me to think about what needs to be happening in literally like the first page of a novel for an editorial assistant who spends all day looking at novels. Um, for it to jump out and seem different and seem like something, you know, that that gets you to the next page. So that was pretty invaluable. But yeah, just, you know, just like Amy is saying, it also gave me hope. It felt um, pretty equitable. You know, I was there and I was reading every single project and I, you know, whether that was common practice or not, was was weighing all of these submissions equally. Um, unless they had a really bad cover letter that was grammatically incorrect, in which case I was not weighing them equally. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, you know, I think I think the slush pile is it's a real thing, and there's it's a way it can be a way in. But I would you know I would recommend going for the agent first before you before you start submitting to publishers. Yeah, I didn't realize the publishers ever. I worked. I also worked in publishing briefly. I worked for a year as a assistant to an agent. Um, although, you know, eight years later when I was submitting my own letters, I, I somehow like forgot everything about <laughs> that job other than the one thing that it really taught me. Yeah. The one thing that it really taught me was that uh, it's a business, particularly from the agent side. And so, you know, they all, I think most literary agents come to it because they love books and they love to read but there's also the very real side of it where they have to make some money. And that was a good, you know, it was good to, to learn that and to remember um, there's lots of reasons why there's lots of reasons to write, but if you want to publish and you want, you know, people to buy your book, you have to write something that, that not only you're interested in, but other people will be interested in too. Um, but I didn't realize that uh, editors and publishing houses read unsolicited yeah, they, that was, that was like most of my job and maybe that's changed in the interim and I definitely know it's, it's better to have an agent and to be submitting that way. And that I think was the bulk of what my editors were reading. Um, and I was reading the unsolicited manuscripts, but they were, you know, they were still getting read. Um, so yeah, that, that kind of gave me a spark of hope as a, you know, a 23 year old in New York, knowing that one day I wanted to write a book, um, that there is, you know there's somebody who's gonna at least read your submission. Yeah, great. So, um, I think that's all of the questions we've got. Okay. Well, thank you both so much. This is fantastic. And, and hearing writers talk about their process and, and how they work is just, it's fascinating. So um, Jacqueline, hopefully you get some inspiration and you'll submit your your uh, manuscript. So thank you so much. And we're going to put this um, up on our um, Arcadia Books YouTube channel. So people that couldn't join us tonight can can still watch. So thank you very much. And read these books. They're fantastic. You will love them. And we'll look forward to what's coming next from, from Amy and Lydia. So thank you and good night. Thanks for having us. Thank, thank you. you for having us. Bye. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.